Hello, hello, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today to this event brought to you by Casablanca Finance City. Today is a big day, it's Africa Day, and we're so glad to be back in this beautiful new setting to honor and celebrate Africa together. Today is about the Africa we want, the Africa we believe in. We are coming together as one community to share real experiences and let everyone see that the change is on. So without further ado, and to kick off this celebration, it's my privilege to introduce to you Mr. Saeed Ibrahimi, CEO of Casablanca Finance City, for his welcome note. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. On this day, 58 years ago, the Organization of African Unity, now known as the African Union, was born. Since its inception, it held the idea that only through unity and regional integration could Africa unlock its full potential. Today we pay tribute to all those who fought for the economic and political integration of our continent. As we mark this Africa Day, once again in the shadow of the coronavirus pandemic, we also hold on to the promise of a brighter future Narratives over the past few decades have painted a wide range of negative views on Africa. Poor development, political unrest, poverty, forced migration and diseases. The truth is, as always, more nuanced. And while recognizing undeniable progress does not lift our responsibility from working on some realities, one thing is certain. The transformation that Africa has undergone in recent decades has been remarkable. Africa is shaping its own destiny and should be referred to as the African opportunity instead of the African threat. At Casablanca Finance City, we want to play our part in changing the narrative. We are proud to bring together 200 African believers and we want more people and investors to see and believe that the change is on. We need to move faster and at scale. I would like to express a heartfelt thank you to the wonderful lineup of speakers who accepted our invitation today and extend our congratulations for a happy Africa Day to all CFC members and fellow Africans. Have a great day. Thank you very much, Mr. Ibrahimi. Indeed, Africa's image in the world is mainly seen through distorted lens of misconceptions. It would greatly benefit from an updated narrative and some good PR. Today, with our guests, we want to describe the extent of the African business opportunities in three key sectors. We'll do that in three parts, infrastructure, digital transformation, and financing. For our first conversation on infrastructure, I'm excited to start off with three experts and on the topic and members from the CFC community. Mr. Philippe Miquel, CEO of NG North Africa. Hello. Hello. Mr. Raza Hasnani, Managing Director, Head of Infrastructure Investments at Africa 50. Hi. Mr. Mohamed Rashid, uh, Director of Financial Sector and Institutional Affairs at Casablanca Finance City. Good morning. Welcome to you all and many thanks indeed for your time. Before we dive in, let's watch this short video and be right back. In all economies of the world, infrastructure is the key to prosperity and progress. Therefore, investment in infrastructure is crucial to boost the continent's economic growth. Africa continues to suffer from an infrastructure deficit, which makes it a breeding ground for investments. The need for infrastructure funding in Africa is estimated at 130 to $170 billion a year in many sectors, such as renewables, ICD, transportation. It is especially important now, given the entry into force of the continental free trade area. In Africa, the infrastructure financing gap is estimated to be $108 billion a year, but significant progress has been made. Since 2000, annual investment in infrastructure has doubled to around $80 billion a year. Institutions such as Africa 50, an infrastructure investment platform established by African governments and the African Development Bank, 
plays a major role in providing support to investors at every stage of the project, accelerating the delivery while mitigating risks and seeking reasonable return on investment. Many developers are leading the way such as NG Africa, a long-term partner for Africa's growing energy needs. The continent's potential is vast and Casablanca Finance City is committed to supporting its community in grasping this potential and closing the financing gap. Let me start with you, Mr. Hasnani. You have over 23 years of infrastructure, private equity, and impact investing experience in Africa, Asia, and the Americas. You started your career at Deloitte in Philadelphia, then you moved to Dallas and Houston, where you led energy and infrastructure projects around the world while at ExxonMobil Corporation. Here you are now, living in the capital city of Morocco, where you lead the infrastructure investments business at Africa 50, which, by the way, we're very proud to have as a member of our CFC community. Thank you so much for joining us. So my first question, as we just saw in the video, before COVID, the financing gap was already estimated uh, above 100 billion US dollars annually. And now the gap is even bigger due to foreign capital flights. How do we bridge that gap? Thank you. Uh, let me start by first thanking you for inviting me to this distinguished panel and to CFC for hosting this important discussion on Africa Day. Infrastructure is definitely one of Africa's most pressing needs. And this is true now more than ever as we recover from the COVID pandemic and build back more resilient societies. In fact, at Africa 50, we think that infrastructure should be a key component of any post-pandemic recovery program. As you mentioned, the financing gap is still huge, but that is also a great investment opportunity. Indeed, given the limited resources of governments, attracting private sector capital is key to bridging the gap. And this is our mandate at Africa 50. We are an investment platform that was created by African governments and by African central banks, including the African Development Bank, to accelerate the delivery of sustainable infrastructure on the continent. We invest equity into projects. We leverage our capital to bring in other investors from the private sector, as well as debt funding from financial institutions. So we have two business lines which work together to bridge the funding gap. Uh, PD, which is project development, helps develop projects and Project Finance, the business that I lead, acts as a private equity firm embedded within Africa 50 and invests in projects at financial close, into platforms, and provides growth capital. Now, in our view, it is a bit of a myth when people say that there's not enough financing available for projects. There is actually always enough financing available for well-developed projects. The problem is that there is a lack of well-developed projects and Africa 50 is purpose-built to solve that problem. Uh, investors will come if there's a reasonable return with a reasonable risk within a reasonable amount of time. If they have to deal with risks they cannot control or mitigate, or if they have to tie up their capital for a long period of time without progress, then that'll scare away capital. The, the issues are at the early stage. So when you look, talk about funding the, or bridging the infrastructure gap, the focus has to be on the early stage. McKinsey estimates that 80% of infrastructure projects in Africa fail in the development stage, and only 10% reach financial close. It is also found that in the sixth largest infrastructure markets in Africa, the cost of the feasibility study phase alone is about $30 billion. So Africa 50 contributes to the continent's inclusive growth through private and PPP investments in uh, infrastructure. We bring together project development and project finance under one entity. So we function like a one-stop shop with the ability to deploy capital throughout the life cycle of a project. Thank you so much for that. I have a second question for you. How, how could we leverage more domestic resources for Africa? That's a very good question because there is a very large and growing base of domestic investors in Africa. Uh, this includes regional banks, including the Moroccan banks. Um, there are quite a few domestic private equity funds. And in fact, in our view, 
Infrastructure in Africa and in emerging markets in general actually has quite a few of the characteristics of private equity. So if there are well-developed projects available, if there are good opportunities available, that will induce private equity firms to invest in infrastructure. Then another major source are Africa, uh, African institutional investors. Pre-COVID, the estimate was that the assets under management of African institutional investors would rise to almost $1.8 trillion by the end of 2020. Then there are about 400 African companies with revenues of over a billion dollars a year. Then there are African sovereign wealth funds, which are also rapidly growing and many, many countries have them. So the capital is out there looking for bankable opportunities. But the solution, to, uh, the solution to bringing in this domestic capital is about the same as the solution to bringing in international capital. Domestic investors in Africa are very sophisticated, if not, uh, if not more sophisticated, they're as sophisticated as international investors. And they have an added advantage of having a very good on the ground understanding of the risk. So if they have the ability to invest in projects that are well prepared, where the risks and returns are allocated properly, there will be a rush to invest in those projects. Thank you so much. I'd love to hear uh, about the opportunities, but before we do so, I'd like to turn to you, Mr. Um, Philippe Miquel. You also have uh, an extensive business experience here in Africa. Before you moved to Morocco in March 2019 as CEO of NG North Africa, you held several leadership positions in Yaoundé, Cameroon, and Abidjan, Ivory Coast. NG, as we know, is the largest independent electricity producer in the world. We are neighbors at the CFC Tower, actually. Obviously, very proud to have you as a member of our business community as well. Do you have any reaction on what has been said right now? Sure. Uh, thank you uh, indeed for, for having us. I think uh, it's an important topic that we're addressing today. Uh, when you look at the numbers, indeed, that looks uh, gigantic, 100 billion per year to, to bridge the gap. Uh, Post-COVID, it's going to be extremely complicated. But I think it's actually an opportunity to turn into the solutions of tomorrow, on the one hand, and the solutions um, dedicated or applied to Africa, on the other. If we look at the uh, energy uh, space where NG is operating in, for um, in Africa and uh, elsewhere in 70 countries in the world, um, the world of energy is going through a significant transition. We were used to building large power plants that were uh, feeding a network that were supplying customers. That system is going backwards. Our customers are today becoming producers of their own production, of their own needs. Through groups of uh, solar, through uh, the reuse of their waste into biogas with the battery of their cars, where they don't use their cars, through um, zero uh, energy buildings. That world is the world of tomorrow. Google in the US has put an offer where you can buy the energy of the car of your neighbor. And we very much believe that um, uh, the world of tomorrow in the energy space is the world of um, sharing energy among users. And so we move away from that very centralized world. And that very centralized world is, is quite costly, actually, hence the uh, part of that uh, 100 billion. How does that translate in Af for Africa? Well, currently, NG in Africa is servicing about 4 million people with what we call the solar home systems. It's a small solar panel with a, a battery with appliances connected to it. Um, and that's the African translation of the world that I just described. And um, it's much less costly for Africa to uh, develop through that route than through a very centralized system with large power plant networks supplying customers. Uh, we looked at, that, uh, at those figures connecting one house to the grid, which is far into um, the uh, African uh, surroundings cost about 4,000 euros to connect one house. A solar home system is between 250, 250 to 400 euros, a factor of 10. And so one way to bridge the gap that we mentioned is to apply those models 
um, to Africa. Uh, and, was, and that is made possible by what you mentioned in the, in the short movie that we've seen, the uh, development of uh, renewable energy. There'll be a, it's also made possible by uh, the de development of digital tools that will be part of a, uh, a panel uh, later today. And so if we do that, combine, we, we will still need large power infrastructure. But combining uh, those um, uh, infrastructures with solutions that are applied and dedicated to Africa is to me one way to quickly bridge that uh, gap and accelerate that past uh, the COVID uh, era. That's a very interesting perspective from a developer's point of view on how to, fi to bridge that financing gap. Now, uh, as we know, NG has over 50 years of experience on the continent. And we are talking today to potential investors who are looking to invest in Africa. What's your feedback on the business environment in Africa? How did you make it work? Well, it's, uh, indeed, we've been present in, in uh, over 50 uh, years. We are operating in, two, in three space. Uh, the uh, first one is a large uh, power infrastructure in the uh, renewable space, which is um, our uh, strategy going forward. Uh, we are also uh, operating in the field that I just described, what we call en energy access, supplying solar home systems, mini-grid based on renewable to um, individual. And we're also operating in the space of uh, energy servicing, uh, making sure that uh, uh, our customers are using energy the most uh, um, efficient, uh, through the most efficient way uh, as, as possible. Our experience in Africa has always um, been extremely positive, despite uh, indeed uh, some, some drawbacks. Uh, uh, there's a lot of needs, for sure. Uh, as I mentioned, that there was a lot of people willing to invest. That, that is true. There are also a lot of people willing to finance a project. Uh, yet we see very uh, 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 not enough kilowatt hours that are being produced on a, on a daily basis. But the needs are, are there. The capabilities are there for sure. Uh, the um, people wanting to develop and finance are uh, also knocking on the door at the door uh, on, a, on a daily basis. Um, and everything we've done in Africa has always translated, in terms of our, our assets, um, has always translated into project on time, on budget, and in terms of um, performance at the expected um, performance um, level. And, and um, uh, the reason for that is uh, because, again, of the capabilities that you find in, uh, in, uh, in Africa, the fact that we've always been locally grounded, and that helps uh, tremendously, and also the fact that we have applied uh, the technology, the way we do business in the 70 countries uh, where we operate, to uh, Africa, so we've brought that knowledge, and in um, in uh, as a as a result or as a feedback, we've been extremely uh, successful in terms of uh, the quality of our uh, operation uh, in Africa. And so for us, it um, remains a, a significant uh, territory for uh, for investment, particularly in the space of energy, where the needs are extremely significant. Well, that's brilliant. I mean, projects on time, on budget, on the expected performance level, that certainly can help change some, some perceptions. Thank you so much for your insight. I'm moving, moving to you, Mohamed. You are Director of Financial Sector and Institutional Affairs at Casablanca Finance City, also a member of the Executive Committee. CFC is an African financial center committed to the continent's future and also a business partner to over 200 companies operating in 50 countries in Africa helping them unlock that potential. So it has been mentioned uh, earlier by Mr. Ibrahimi in his welcome note that Africa's narrative has been tainted by all sorts of misconceptions. As we are speaking to potential investors right now, what are these main misconceptions? Uh, how could we unpack those? Thank you, Manal. It's a very good question. It reminds me when the Economist magazine declared in 2000 that Africa is hopeless. And then in 2011 as arising, and then in 2013 as aspiring. With all the progress that has been made 
uh, in recent years and the perspective of the African uh, Continental Free Trade Agreements, uh, which will be the largest in the, the globe by the 2050, I think that Africa has a strong fundamentals to be the next investment and business destination. But unfortunately, investors still hold a bunch of misconceptions. And first and foremost, a common mistake made by investors is to view Africa as a country, uh, not as a continent with 54 countries with different laws, rules, regulations related to trade and investment, with different risk profiles, with different uh, comparative advantages, and this is a real, real misconception. The second one is that Africa is risky. Uh, I think that it's all about risk management because Africa is very well rewarded in this risk takers at higher returns. Today, investors have a range of uh, risk mitigating instruments, risk mitigating products from the IBRD, from the IFC, from the MIGA, multilateral investment guarantees. And that's very well and uh, very important to uh, use them when appropriate and where appropriate. Also, today, investors have good risk assessment tools. I mean, to disaggregate risks uh, specific to sectors and specific to the uh, different countries. And that last but not least, one strategy to mitigate the investment in Africa is to use a good entry point. And this is the role of CFC. A good entry point to operate from a vibrant ecosystem like ours. Uh, it offers attractive doing business. It offers significant incentives. And it helps remove some of the uh, barriers. A third misconception is about poor infra infrastructure. I think that significant progress have, has been made in recent years and Africa is moving uh, uh, to close this uh, infrastructure gap. The fourth misconception is about insecurity. Mm -hmm. But you have just to have a look to the global peace index of the uh, Economist magazine and you will see that uh, uh, a lot of countries uh, are peaceful and have been peaceful for a long decade without uh, any uh, other uh, problem. The last misconception is about poor business environment. And uh, it's not the truth. I mean, uh, the ease of doing business has extremely improved in uh, Africa. And uh, at the extent that uh, many of the many countries like Morocco, uh, Rwanda, Kenya, uh, outperform some of the countries like Brazil, Russia, and India. And remember that these countries was considered like as a heaven or a good, attractive destination for investment, uh, I mean, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, because it was the restricted, limited group of uh, BRICS. These are some misconceptions about investment in Africa. I think that identifying them helps us to, break, to, to break them. Uh, but um, honestly, uh, for sure, the best move to take uh, to cap the potential or the full potential for Africa is to operate from Africa because the total mix of information is, uh, I mean, about an investment is significantly altered when you are not in Africa. Thank you so much, uh, Mohamed Rashid, for uh, those insights. I mean, definitely there are some realities, but that will help uh, our audience uh, go check up and look up all these facts. So before we wrap up this session, I'd like to um, have one final word on the opportunities. So going back to you, Mr. Raza Hasnani, what are the opportunities? How do you see um, infrastructure investment looking forward? Yeah, so for us at Africa 50, it is self-evident that Africa is the land of opportunity. And there are many good investment pro prospects. This is all driven by the factors that uh, the other panelists talked about, you know, the, the secular growth, the rising disposable incomes, the growing middle class, which creates a very, very strong foundation for investment prospects on the continent. So we see opportunities in the traditional sectors, such as energy and transport, but also to sectors that are emerging and have actually gained urgency, such as information and communications technology, healthcare, financial technology infrastructure, and education. For example, let's take health infrastructure. Traditionally, this has been the domain of public sector, but it is becoming more attractive for private capital. The middle classes are growing and becoming more health conscious and have increased purchasing power and access to healthcare. And many, many healthcare investments have the nature of infrastructure. Meanwhile, ICT, Information and Communications Technology, 
I don't think anybody needs to be convinced anymore on how critical it is to our lives now. It has become obviously a very, very commercially viable sector and it will need many, many billions over the next decade to connect all Africans, with a third of it in infrastructure. At Africa 50, we look at ICT infrastructure across three verticals. This includes fiber and broadband, data centers, and then telecom towers. And all three are very attractive sectors. There is a lot of international and local capital coming in, which is a good news for the African consumer because when a lot of capital is chasing projects, the cost of capital goes down, and very, very importantly, the prices paid by the ultimate customers go down. Power generation has been taking off for several years, including IPPs, and Africa's ample and renewable, ample renewable and hydrocarbon resources is going to make this a very, very attractive sector. And finally, infrastructure opportunities will grow further with the implementation of the African free trade, uh, African continental free trade area, which will create larger markets and economies of scale for investors. Thank you so much. A lot of opportunities for you to go uh, check, out, check out out there. Um, ICT, definitely, we have a full section dedicated to that in just a couple of minutes. Mr. Philippe Michel, um, on your side, what would be one word you would address to potential investors and how do you see the opportunities moving forward? I think uh, in the space of, uh, of energy, in the space of uh, infrastructure, Uh, as I said earlier, there, there's a lot of needs and, and that comes with a lot of uh, opportunity as far as we are concerned at ENGIE. Uh, one example that I'd like to, to, to take in the space of renewable energy, which is, by the way, one way for Africa to gain uh, its independence uh, on the, um, in its uh, energy supply. There's a lot of wind uh, in, in Africa and uh, there's a lot of sun In, uh, in the region. One country is, is a good example of that, Senegal. Uh, had about 800 megawatt of installed capacity uh, up until 2018. Most of it uh, was based on fossil fuel. Today, it's about 1,400, and the, the, the gap has been uh, bridged by renewable uh, energy. We are developing two uh, renewable solar PV uh, plant um, that, where the lowest cost in Western Africa uh, when we uh, develop the, the project. We are nearing completion. It's uh, 25 and 35 megawatt uh, of solar PV in Senegal that will uh, fuel a supply uh, about uh, 530,000 uh, uh, people that will help avoid about 89,000 uh, ton of CO2 that will be uh, avoided. And uh, Senegal, like many other African countries, have um, uh, bet on renewable, focused on uh, renewable energy going forward. It is today both the most climate compatible uh, technology and it's um, in terms of uh, uh, full cost, the lower cost technology to produce power, both solar and wind, are the lowest cost technology to supply power. So that comes also with the ability to uh, regain or gain uh, financial uh, efficiency for uh, countries of, uh, of Africa. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We're moving on to the next section now, digital transformation in Africa. Let's watch this short video and then I'll be back to welcome my new guests. Although Africa lags slightly behind other regions in terms of digital maturity, the digital sector infrastructure is progressing on the continent, and the future is bright. Digital technologies are entering all aspects of African life, and both supply and demand are improving. Currently, there are 1.8 billion mobile phone connections, 453 million internet users, and 218 million active social media users. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated Africa's digital transformation and we have seen substantial progress in sectors such as e-commerce, mobile financial services and online education. However, much more needs to be done and it is estimated that 80 to 100 billion dollars will be needed over the next 10 years to finance Africa's digital transformation. The digital sector 
through its different tools and mobile apps, is essential for stimulating economic development, improving the business environment, and raising the standard of living of Africa's 1.2 billion people. By 2050, Africa's population is expected to double to 2.4 billion. The digital transformation of Africa is therefore a key issue, firstly for the well-being of Africans, but also to ensure that trade with the rest of the world takes place in a harmonious and equal framework. I am glad to welcome now two young entrepreneurs and African disruptors, Mr. Badr Idrisi, co-founder of Atlant Space. Hello. Hi. And Mr. Hamza bin Dhu, co-founder of Soit. Hi. Hello. We'll get to know more about you and your journey in just a few moments. Before we do so, please join me in welcoming our special guest connecting all the way from Kigali, Mr. Lassina Kone. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. Mr. Kone, you are CEO of Smart Africa, which is a bold and innovative commitment from African heads of state and governments to accelerate socio-economic development on the continent through affordable access to broadband and usage of ICT. Prior to that, you were the advisor to the Prime Minister of the Republic of Côte d'Ivoire in charge of digital transformation and public reforms. And you were also advisor to the president of Ivory Coast from 2011 to 2017. Mr. Kuni, could you please give us an overview on Africa's digitalization today? Where do we stand? Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, on behalf of Smart Africa Alliance and myself, I really would like to thank you for this invitation to participate in this discussion on digital transformation on the continent. It is true, actually, uh, this uh, is through coming together in an engagement like this that uh, we can have uh, an open, honest, and transparent discussion about these uh, transformation of Africa. You see, uh, natural resources dominate the structure of wealth in Africa. We all know that. For example, oil accounts for 43.5% of sub Saharan Africa wealth, while land accounts for about 35%, according to <laughs> studies. However, Natural resources are finite and uh, are not sustainable on the long run. The most sustainable solution to accelerate the social economic development of our countries in Africa is to transform Africa's traditional economic, economy into a knowledge-based economy. Indeed, uh, such uh, economies are built on investing in human capital by building scientific and technological knowledge, uh, which are actually finite. Current Africa digital economy represents about 1.3% uh, of the world digital economy. Uh, China and the United States together, both of them, they have close to 90%. Uh, China having about 22%, US about 70% of dominance of the digital economy. But with the right momentum and support, this can quickly grow you know, to rival you know, other leading digital economies such as China and the US. Uh, the opportunities uh, for Africa, there is a lot of opportunity for Africa. For example, you know, the market is as big as China. Africa is almost uh, 1.2 billion population, and uh, we have uh, a youth bulge in the workforce. Africa is the youngest continent in the world, with an average age of uh, uh, 19 years old compared to the U.S., which is 38, and compared to Europe, which is 43. And 60% of Africans are below the age of 25. This represents a huge opportunity for digitalization. So, and also trade investment and mobile money and so on and so forth. And I would like to throw this in. With a 1.3% market share of the world digital economy, and we have a 63% of the market share in the mobile money in the world, it represents a tremendous opportunity. Where are we send digitalization? Every country is actually striving to grow at least to put the ICT at the center of the socioeconomic development, but it's not really done in a very harmonized way, in a structured way. And this is the challenge that we have. And to you, the main challenge is like for, for, for digital transformation that we have right now, it's the digital skills. Yeah. Uh, about 230 million jobs in Africa will need a digital skills by 2030. And 2030 is only nine years from now. When you look at the infrastructure in 2019, the internet penetration in Africa, was 34% compared to 77% global. Digital policy and regulation, which is also a challenge. For example, as of May, 
Only 29 countries in Africa and all continents have adopted the data protection law because this becomes really a challenge. So for us in Smart Africa to address the above challenges that I just mentioned, you know, Smart Africa has identified three following uh, strategic objectives to be able to address all these challenges of digital transformation. I'm not going to go into the detail. I'm just going to touch base on them. It's basically, the first one is to build affordable digital infrastructure. Number two is to promote and facilitate doing business in Africa. It's only when we, uh, when we have a, an adaptive regula regulatory environment that we can attract uh, investors in Africa. And number three will be to accelerate the birth of uh, and the development of digital literacy and digital society in Africa. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kone, for, for, for that. I have a second uh, question. Africa is often perceived as a follower rather than a pioneer when it comes to innovation, uh, mistakenly perceived, I would say. What are some of the African innovations that you could tell us about? Thank you very much for these questions. Uh, I will actually put your question in the past. Africa was seen as a follower. The narrative uh, in Africa today is changing. For example, the rate is changing for so many reasons. Africa, we have no legacy system in terms of digital transformation. So Africa has the potential to give up a lot of tools in this continent these days, and it is happening. For example, as I mentioned previously, yes, we represent about 1.3% of the digital economy based to the digital government, the progress in the digital government transformation. However, Africa today, we own about 63% of mobile money which was never created anywhere in the world. The mobile money was actually born in Africa, in the context of Africa, and is dominating the world today. So now, if you see, things are really changing because now the West is taking the experience from the South, and this is what is happening on the mobile money technology. And we have a potential because I, I don't like to, you know, it's good to speak in the past, we are a follower, but I can assure you something, on the fourth industrial revolution, with the ingredient that I explained about the African continent and the potential, there's a good chance in less than two decades from now, it will be something that Africa will be leading and the rest, the rest of the world will be actually following. Thank you so, so much, Mr. Kone, for connecting with us and sharing these insights. We appreciate your time indeed. Happy Africa Day. Africa is home to many disruptors addressing innovative solutions, looking to solve real pain points and create direct impact. Atlan Space is a young Moroccan startup specialized in artificial intelligence. The technology developed by Atlan Space received the innovative prize of the African Entrepreneurship Award in 2017. And the company was ranked among the top 10 artificial intelligence startups in Europe in 2018 by NVIDIA, which is one of the largest chipset manufacturers in the world. But Idrissi, welcome to you. Um, so my first question, you are the co-founder of Atlan Space, as we previously said, which is a technology company. Mm -hmm. You were recently featured on CNN as a promising startup, a member of the CFC community. And there's something really interesting about how your journey began. You had a secure and comfortable position in uh, big US companies and multinationals, but then something happened while you were speaking with a friend of yours and you decided to make the jump to entrepreneurship. Can you share that story with us? So first of all, thank you very much, Manel, for inviting me to this very special day to all of us. So um, the, the story of Atlant Space really started with a genuine discussion I had with Younes Moumen, who is the CTO. Uh, the Paris Agreement was just signed, and Morocco was announced to be organizing the COP22. And we had this discussion about our generation's legacy. And we were shocked to know that in Africa, if we don't do anything, rhinoceroses and elephants will disappear. So our kids will just hear about them as we heard about dinosaurs and mammoths. We, dis we started understanding what's happening and so on, and we were deeply shocked to know that more than 20% of the fisheries in the world are illegal. Coming from Morocco, a coastal country where fisheries is, I mean, a very big component of our culture and history and economy, we decided to see how developed countries are tackling the issue. 
And we found out that they are using light planes, which in Africa we don't have financial means and human resources to use them. We tried to use uh, uh, drones instead of the light planes, but we found out that there is technical limitation and human limitation to the drones. So the first limitation was that the drones cannot go beyond the horizon because of this transmission signal, technical transmission signal problems. And it's okay to find one drone pilot, two drone pilots, but once you would like to scale the solution and go for 10, 20, 100 pilots, you will not be able to easily find them in uh, emerging and developing countries. So we decided to replace those two main challenges with artificial intelligence, allowing the drones to go beyond the horizon and tackle the, the uh, illegal fishing issue. Once we developed the technology, we found out that what we've developed is not only specific to illegal fishing. It was more a platform that can be used for different scenarios going, for example, from uh, deforestation to uh, uh, pol pollution tackling in the ocean to other specification. So we developed uh, an artificial intelligence that mimics human pilots on board drones, allowing them to fly beyond visual line of sight and beyond horizon with different type of missions that can be applied to. Awesome, that's really inspiring. I'll be, I'll be right back to you to see what you think about the future of digital transformation. Now from one successful African startup to another, I am glad to welcome also Hamza Bendhu, who is co-founder of Sowit, um, one of the first startups to join the CFC community. Sowit empowers African farmers to optimize their activities and make strategic decisions thanks to innovative solutions that analyze farmers' plots optimize fertilization. So Hamza, thanks for being here. Um, I know you're passionate about precision agriculture. The African Union actually published a report on that topic to which SOWIT has participated. So my first question to you, what is exactly precision agriculture and why have you specialized in this segment? Thank you very much, Manal, and thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you on this day. Uh, precision agriculture is a technology that uses data, mainly imagery, to help a farmer observe and take action on the viability of his field. Basically, we do not consider a farmer's field as a homogeneous block any anymore. Rather, it is divided into zones that need different inputs at different times. And this is based on many variables, mainly agro-pedoclimatic variables that we integrate into our algorithms. So that's the technology that we develop at uh, SOWIT, and we hope to uh, bring accurate information to uh, African farmers uh, through digital solutions, web and mobile applications. Actually, here there are two keywords, information and digital. Information, because we're not only talking about you know, very high-end information, very expert stuff, we're also talk talking about basic information uh, that uh, is brought to the farmer precisely and frequently. And this is actually what prompted the creation of SOWIT. Uh, because we, when you look at uh, how farming uh, is in Africa, you see that African farmers are kind of left alone on their fields. They, have, they, don't, they don't have any support. When you look at Europe, at Europe or at the US, you see that farmers have, uh, are part of cooperatives, have technical centers that feed them information, actually that flood them with information, information that goes from the basic to the very complex and sometimes even free information like uh, remote sensing advice that is free part of their partnership. So we think that uh, this uh, information gap is the cause, the main cause of the productivity gap you see in Africa. For example, you can see that yield uh, for wheat in Africa, average yield is around two, three tons per hectare, whereas you can have in other parts of the world six or seven tons per hectare. So that's the main, uh, I would say, a problem we're trying to tackle. Then uh, I said that there was a second keyword, which is digital. Digital because once you're tackling the problem, you need to bring this solution to the African farmer, and that's a whole other challenge. And we're trying to solve this in several ways. First, uh, we're developing a freemium business model where on, uh, the farmer can connect to our app and uh, have a lots of free stuff and get up to speed at his own pace. So once he's ready, once he's mature enough, he can then go to more complex products. We also, as a startup, we can't tackle smallholder farmers directly and uh, di directly because 
there are too much complexities, which we talked about also in the previous segment on uh, infrastructure. So we work with ministries, uh, institutions like the Ministry of Ethiopia, Ministry of Agriculture in Ethiopia, Ministry of Agriculture in Morocco, because these institutions have the power to disseminate the information to the African smallholder farmer. And finally, uh, it's kind of a loop, but uh, we're quite happy to see that uh, now we have some organic uh, farmers coming organically to us, uh, smallholder farmers less than five hectares, for example, in Morocco, calling to uh, get information or buy our products. That's, that's brilliant. And actually, you're serving uh, more than 4,500 hectares of land, providing advice to farmers. So about that idea of getting together and, and creating a network, you have created the uh, hashtag Africa Goes Digital Network. Could you tell us more about this project? Yes, um, thank you. Thank you. That's a, that's a good question because uh, networking in Africa is a very important uh, question. We, we need to create uh, bridges between companies, people, farmers. Uh, Africa Coast Digital actually uh, was created under CTA, the Center for Technical Assistance, uh, financed by the European Commission. And um, once CTA closed, it has uh, become an independent association managed by four member companies, including SOIT. So uh, Africa Coast Digital's uh, aim is to consolidate a number of companies into uh, a consortium uh, which leverages drones and uh, remote sensing in order to bring digital solutions in multiple industries, ranging from uh, agriculture, forestry to mining, for example. So uh, we, we were part of the founding member, members of uh, Africa Goes Digital, and this felt quite natural because as a NACTEC uh, company that, that aims to build bridges uh, between European uh, research institutes, African research institutes, African farmers using digital technology, we think that industry sharing, communication between companies, uh, exchange of, of information yields the most power in order to bring this solution. And we bring them using Africa Goes Digital in multiple ways. First, and that's very important for Africa, it's Capacity building. Capacity building because you need to train people on these technologies. So uh, with my co-founder, Hamza Hashem, we, we uh, uh, trained uh, in 20 plus uh, countries in Africa, multiple companies to precision agriculture, uh, using drones, collecting data to our quality standards. Uh, then the second, uh, I would say, way we use is that through this network of companies, we're able to provide services, use these companies when we don't have a service. And actually, uh, in this COVID-19 uh, context, it made a lot of sense because mobility being reduced, we had the opportunity to uh, talk with partner companies who had boots on the ground to do data collection with us. What's important is that we knew uh, the quality, that the quality of data they were going to take for us was good to our quality standards. So. Also, being part of Agagos Digital is uh, a, a, a great, I would say, a personal uh, uh, thing about this association is that we are visiting Africa, we are talking with farmers, with companies, with youth in Africa, and this really helps us get a more focused understanding about what are the needs, how we can bring these solutions. Uh, finally, uh, we've seen through Agagos Digital uh, lots of uh, projects in rural areas of Africa aiming at, I would say, streamline processes, streamline data collection, empower youth to create businesses, train youth in order to create businesses in their uh, rural areas and create sustainable businesses using digital solutions that I would say would interest them to uh, stay in their, in their uh, villages. So that's uh, awesome. Yeah, that that's the power of network, right? Working all together definitely allows us to make more impact and and to reach out to more people. So, um, but going back to you, th th this segment is about digital transformation in Africa. What's your view on the future of digital transformation in Africa? Uh, I strongly believe that Africa is full of challenges and problems, which means that it's full of opportunities. And what technology has allowed uh, continents such as Africa with its four, uh, 54 uh, countries. Uh, I mean, technology, uh, before 2005, 2000, 2000 uh, every project needed a huge infrastructure to start, to kickstart the project. 
which is not anymore necessary today with cloud computing, the dissemination of devices all over Africa and so on. So for example, in our case, uh, if we were uh, willing to start the project in the 2000s, we'd have needed just to start with a five, uh, 500,000 US dollars to buy servers, which were accessible for us uh, in the cloud. So it's, it's really, I mean, there is a leapfrog that happened with technology that allows today uh, innovators and startups and entrepreneurs all over Africa to start project, digital projects, and be able to launch uh, global solutions. And this is only available and uh, a, uh, startups are only able to do it because this kind of technology such as the cloud is today available. We don't, we don't need this huge infrastructure to start a project. We just need a good idea that tackles a real problem on the field. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Well, I have one final question to you both before we wrap up this segment. So we saw that entrepreneurship in Africa is all about solving pain points and um, really creating impact. How can we go from being local problem sol solvers to international disruptors? Who wants to take that first? Okay, I can go. If you yeah. <laughs> so I, I, that's a very good question. So uh, actually, when we created Sowit, at our core, we really wanted to be an African company. Uh, obviously, for a startup, it's really complicated. It's a process. We've managed to work in multiple countries in both West and East Africa. But uh, actually, the question you're asking and the question of scalability is... I would say a question that we ask we ask ourselves every every morning because uh, I, I think there are two 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 types of answers on this. There is the general uh, part which is more linked to regulatory uh, environment. You you need to create a regional footprint. Uh, uh, in Africa. So you need to be aware of different process policies, different custom policies, uh, uh, etc. And uh, this is really uh, something that's, uh, um, that's slowing us when, when, when we're starting. And being part of a CFC, uh, of CFC community is really important because one of the main things is also to attract talent. And when you're able to attract talent and to uh, uh, not have to worry about administrative stuff like work permits and stuff like that, it's really important. A second thing I would say is uh, obviously uh, promoting your product. You can have the best product in the world. If nobody knows what it does, it, it, there's no point in that. Um, and uh, finally, I think we, we, we'll agree also uh, uh, with Bader and the all startups, uh, I think not only in Africa, it's financing, particularly in Africa, because when you look at interest rates, of banks, of local banks, they are very high. So you need to find, I would say, alternative ways to finance your project, to finance your ambition, to have the means for your ambition. And uh, so you have solutions like venture capital, private equity, crowdfunding that help uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, on the second part, I would say that uh, for me, there is also a technical uh, challenge about scalability. You're going to Africa, you're going to multiple countries, you, you need to develop a product that is general enough, but brings enough value to different types of, uh, for, for in our case, different types of farmers. So I think those are for me the main challenges. Thank you so much. What's your take on that? Yeah, so for uh, going from a local market, uh, Moroccan market or African market to global market, we, uh, we built a kind of strategy and framework. So the first step for us was getting recognition. We're doing AI, artificial intelligence in Africa. Africa is not known for technology. It's not known for artificial intelligence. So the first step for us was to get recognized for what we're doing and get validators. Uh, this happened by participating to programs and challenges. So you said that uh, in your introduction of Atlas Space that we won some prizes. Those prizes gave us the first validation for what we're doing. So for example, when NVIDIA is saying that we are one of the top 10 startups in Europe coming from Morocco doing artificial intelligence. This gives us validation and recognition. Also winning the African Entrepreneurship Award was a recognition and a validator for investors, customers, and so on to, uh, to allow us to say that what we're developing is really something true and it's working. So the first thing, as I said, is recognition. Then once we recognized locally or regionally about what we're doing, comes the second part, which is 
building a network and partnership. We cannot do everything ourselves. So we started by building partnership with NGOs. With, uh, we're part, for example, of the We Robotic uh, NGO that is uh, disseminating the use of drones all over the world uh, for, uh, for good use cases. And so uh, building this network, building this, I mean, people that support us every day in, in the cause that we're trying to, to achieve. So partnership, second, second part, then comes the financing. Uh, the, the financing by itself is tricky in Africa. Uh, it's less accessible, I would say, but it's still there. So y- you need to work on the values and the advantages that we have in Africa and mitigate the risks that investors all over the world are seeing for an African startup. So financing, but the, the most challenging part for me would be getting access to a pool of resources. Yeah. The Mor- Moroccan diaspora or the African diaspora is huge. We have very excellent, competent resources all over the world that are also working in Morocco or all over the world. But for a startup to get access to those people and hire them, it's very difficult. We're still having this perception, cultural perception, that, uh, I mean, excellent talents should work for big companies, big names, or the government, rather than starting an adventure or being part of a journey uh, in a startup. So for me, those are the, the, the most challenges that a startup needs to come uh, over to be able to grow globally and scale. Yeah, well, I hear you. I mean, financing, partnerships, talent pool, those are all aspects that are really important. And on our side at Casablanca Finance City, we're definitely committed to supporting the innovative ecosystem in Morocco and beyond in Africa. Well, that was inspiring. Who said we were lagging behind in artificial intelligence? You just heard from two innovative startups who are flying drones using artificial intelligence while creating some real impact in their communities. I wish you both a lot of success and thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Moving on to our third and last segment for today's conversation, finance is considered the backbone of any economy. Building innovative, sustainable and competitive African financial systems is absolutely key for the economic development of our continent. Let's first watch this video and then come back to welcome my guests. According to the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, Foreign direct investments to Africa fell by 18% in 2020. The COVID-19 pandemic and the uncertainty about its evolution will likely continue to affect FDI flows to Africa in the short term. This led to a negative impact on the budgets of many states and increased the number of countries at risk of debt distress. In a continent where the level of financial inclusion remains low and where financing of small and medium-sized enterprises has always been a challenge, it is essential to diversify and increase sources of finance to build back better. Yet, the opportunities do exist. Funds raised by African tech startups increased by 74% from 2019 to 2020, and a recovery designed and financed largely by Africans is well within reach. Strategies such as asset recycling, continued digitalization, and stronger regional integration can help ensure that Africa is strong enough to fight back. To unfold the topic, I'm excited to welcome more African believers and highly qualified experts around this table. Mr. Smail Dwiri, General Manager at Atija Riwafa Bank. Mr. Hassan Bulkhiyat, co-founder of Southbridge ANI, and Mrs. Lamia Morzuki, Deputy General Manager at CFC and co-chair of the Financial Centers for Sustainability Network. Welcome everyone, thank you so much for your time. Before we dive into our panel discussion, I'd like you all to join me in welcoming a very special guest who is connecting all the way from Paris. He has been Prime Minister of Benin in 2015. He held several positions as a private banker and has extensive knowledge on the business environment in Africa. Mr. Yonel Zansou is currently co-founder of Southbridge Group. Mr. Zansou, thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning, thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you. So, Mr. Sansu, with the increasing flight of foreign capital due to the COVID uh, pandemic, how can Africa finance its own development and fund itself in this new world? 
Now, you, I think you are right to uh, mention the flight of the, the portfolio investments, uh, especially uh, from uh, our uh, financial market or security exchanges. This is very common in a crisis. So it has hit Africa, but also Turkey and many emerging uh, economies. It's very volatile. As soon as you have the beginning uh, of, of a major crisis, and this pandemic has created the deepest crisis of uh, the last 100 years. As soon as you have that, you have the volatility and the flight uh, of everything which can be divested quickly. And that's the case of uh, the portfolio investments. You have also the slowing down of the, the direct investment flows, inflows to Africa, but not only to Africa. I mean, everybody has to protect the cash in those situations, and all the investments projects are slowed down uh, across the world. And we are, we are hit. It's a secondary effect that the major multinationals do not invest uh, in Africa and suspend the move for a while. Having said that, let's keep in mind that the inflows of capital entering in Africa every year are average 5% of the GDP of the continent. When the whole investment effort on the continent is more, depending on the years in between, 21 and 25% of the GDP of the continent. So let's not be obsessed only by uh, the flows coming from foreign investors. And let's consider the fact that our, our firms, our corporates in Africa, are the number one investors, including the informal sector. And let's take into account as well what comes back to the continent in terms of remittances of our migrants, our residents uh, outside of the continent, which is well known in Morocco, but well known across Africa. And those flows, which are the African savings bucket outside the continent coming back to the continent, during this crisis in 2020, it has gone up, gone up compared to 2019, which was a good year. This solidarity is a great contrast with what we have seen in 2009, where we had a major decrease. In this case, the Moroccan residents, the Tunisians residents in Europe, in North America, in Asia, more and more, but the same thing has been observed in uh, Sudan, in Nigeria, in Egypt, which are the other largest countries in terms of receiving those remittances. Those flows, which are African flows coming from uh, outside of the continent and expressing the solidarity have been firmed up in 2020. And let's keep in mind that the main investor in Africa is Africa investing in itself. So yes, we will have the volatility of the international flows, but we have our domestic investment efforts and we have our migrant major efforts an effort which is bigger than the uh, international aid, public aid. And it's not always perceived uh, as such. And it is an act of trust for uh, our economies and an important factor of, of, of stability. Having said that, uh, 
What we have observed, and very recently, uh, with uh, the Paris Summit on the financing of uh, African economies, what we will see at the board meeting of the International Monetary Fund in June, what we will see at the next G20 meeting, we will observe a new deal, a new paradigm in terms of how we will finance tomorrow the, the needs of Africa, and not only to just close the gap and recoup a sort of normal uh, way of financing uh, Africa after a crisis, a major shock, but going forward in order to respond to some systemic constraints. And we will see a large allocation of something which is not a debt, but will be a resource for the governments, and which technically is an allocation of special drawing rights, in French, droit de tirage spécial. And currently, Africa is negotiating for that to go from $33 billion, which is a minimum, up to something which would be closer by 100 billion, which could be used in the coming 12 months and would not increase the debt level because it is not a debt. And this would be an important recovery element, sort of in between 1.5 and 4.5, or 4, let's say 4% of the African GDP. And we have had a recession of 2% of GDP. So in a sense, for the first time in our history, we define a financial tool which will finance the economies through the governments, through the currency reserves, through the central banks, but which recoup what has been lost during this pandemic. So this is new. But there are a lot of other innovations to strengthen the way we support the corporates. And in a sense, you see that very much uh, in Morocco, because Mo Morocco has been a sort of laboratory very fast in the response to pandemics, very fast in vaccination, very fast in supporting corporates with guaranteed uh, loans, with guarantee, a state guarantee, very efficient recourse to multilateral uh, support. Uh, by the IMF and other, uh, uh, other providers uh, of aid. And a very innovative uh, treasury bill uh, for this year, 2021, to support the recovery and a great resilience of the Moroccan banks, which are not Moroccan anymore, only Moroccan, because they are also the largest players in the banking industry in West and Central Africa, sub sahara So we are currently, I think, uh, on a way to give to Africa, negotiating by Africa itself, with a, an important role of some leading countries, Morocco being one of them, and the African Union negotiating for all, we are on the verge of creating the proper toolkit to be able to absorb shocks. And for the first time, we acknowledge that Africa pays too much in terms of interest rates, is too short in terms of durations of the debt uh, raised on the markets, that this is unjustifiable and, and, and un undefensible. So the, the, the awareness now is clear is that the financial engineering and the financial policies have to give proper and long-term remedies in this respect. So I think 
The mindset has completely changed. I will never, ever say that a pandemic is an opportunity. I mean, we have too, too, too much uh, suffered in terms of victims, in terms of destructions, damages. But what is an opportunity is the fact that Africa, be it the private sector, the financial sector among the private sector, all of them have been resilient and creative. And the public authorities as well. And the central banks, which are not necessarily perceived as innovators, they have totally changed. For instance, in West Africa, in the Waimu zone, the central bank has decided to refinance directly the microfinance. It will resolve many needs of the households. It will resolve the working capital needs in the recovery of the small firms, which are far better reached directly because they are so small by microfinance type of products. And in some countries, the traditional banks have invented new ways to work with small or very small uh, entrepreneurial uh, companies, even in, uh, embedded in the, the informal sector. So even the central banks uh, look at what Bank al Maghrib has done in terms of putting in place all the facilities for supporting the companies during the, the major shock period, which was the most terrible in between uh, March and, and, and December the, of last year. So it's not an opportunity, it's a catastrophe. But the fact that we have this degree of resilience on one side and creation of tools for that not to happen again, uh, that is encouraging. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Zensu. Your, your message came across very clearly. Let's not be uh, obsessed, like you said, only by flows coming from foreign investors. You, you also touched on the financial engineering that is much needed for Africa. And we all know that this is at the heart of um, the conversation right now with all head of states um, being uh, together in, in Paris to discuss this matter. So um, I have a follow-up question for you. We are are celebrating Africa Day today, as you know. And uh, as I sh shared earlier with our audience, we chose to celebrate it by playing our part in changing Africa's narrative. There are so many misconceptions out there about doing business in Africa. Things have obviously changed. You cannot think of Africa uh, like you did 10 or 20 years ago. What's your take on that? What's one message you could tell our audience about this, this fact? First and foremost, I would say congratulations to celebrate this Africa Day. And knowing a bit Morocco, I think that in Morocco, you have sort of 365 Africa Days in a, in a year. <laughs> because you have such a clear vision of the fact that our future, be it ourselves in West Africa, you in North Africa, and your influence goes to the Indian Ocean and uh, the Horn of Africa. I mean, it's so clear that our future is endogenous, is on our ground. Uh, and it's so clear, this vision. Uh, and it's more and more a shared, a shared vision. So it's very important to, to have this awareness of the strength of Africa when Africa acts consistently together. You see, the Paris summit would not have happened if Mr. Ramaphosa, acting president of the African Union, had not gathered every Friday six colleagues, heads of state, with a preparation every Wednesday of every week 
during the pandemic of 15 ministers of finance to shape together the new framework. How do we create a moratorium for that? How do we raise more funds and define exactly what are our needs, what tools, and so on? And invited, they invited Mr. Macron, who then invited Madame Mar Merkel, and so on, and colleagues in the European Union, on a Friday of April. And then it has been decided that there will be an effort of solidarity of Europe, unprecedented, negotiated with the African Union. It is what we celebrate, I think, is the beginning of a United Africa Day. It's a United Africa Day in terms of governance, in terms of coordination. Yes, we can improve. Yes, we can gain time in putting together a free trade zone. But for the, for, to give you an idea, we work days and night currently to have the proper fine trade finance system for this free zone, which will be the largest geographically and in terms of number of people, uh, the, the largest continental customs union, efficient in the coming, say, 10, seven to 10 years. But it is now prepared. So nowadays, an Africa Day is a United Africa Day. That's what's new. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, Mr. Zensu, for your time. It was a real privilege having you in this show. Um, I'd like to thank you for your time and happy Africa United Day to you then. We'll see you soon. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, well, that was some food for thought, right? Um, Hasan Bouhiat, let's start with you. You are co-founder of Southbridge a &I, a company that offers strategic advisory for impactful change. Prior to that, you were partner at McKinsey in charge of the social sector in Africa, and you also have an extensive experience with the startup ecosystem in Morocco. We heard Lionel Zansou speak about this needed re-engineering of financing in Africa. What are the other financial mechanisms that can be used to bridge the financing gap in the continent. Thank you. Thank you, Manel, for the introduction. Thank you for uh, this question. I think uh, it's important to acknowledge that uh, um, all countries in Africa have different needs, and this is based on different drivers. Some countries, Lionel spoke about a recession of 2% only in Africa, but uh, we know that some countries have known a much higher recession, like in North Africa. The others have just known a slowdown. Uh, there are countries that have a much more developed financial, you know, a domestic financial system than others. Uh, there are some countries that uh, obviously have a better image and uh, attractiveness for foreign investments given their size or given their uh, their track record and and, and the different uh, uh, you know cultural sometimes uh, links that they can have with uh, with for, with donors or foreign investors. But that being said, uh, I think ultimately. African countries uh, need obviously to create some value and to add value that needs to fuel the growth. And that's where Lionel spoke about the importance of the private sector. And I would like to focus specifically on SMEs mm -hmm. uh, that basically employ 90% of, uh, of uh, whether it's in the informal sector or in the formal sector. And uh, here in, uh, in Africa and in different countries, we have two specificities that make it quite peculiar. One is that there is a very intense competition on the equity side, on the private, uh, private equity side, given that there is a the limited number of targets that we can have uh, that basically suits the different, um, uh, let's say, standards of big, uh, of big companies or for private equity firms. Uh, and that makes basically the number of transactions that are still quite, quite small. And the second specificity on, on, on more on the debt side um, for the SMEs, and we've been doing a specific study on that, is that even that there are now some new 
mechanisms on some new uh, products. Uh, the SME sector is still quite neglected. There's some banks in in uh, in in, in Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa also are more focused on big corporates and uh, and uh, also on you know uh, local bonds etc. And at the end of the day, uh, it creates also a distortion in the market as only big companies uh, are, are being basically funded. Um, so given this situation, we definitely need to develop some innovations in, uh, in, uh, in Africa on these two topics, obviously on the equity side, on the debt side. On the equity side, what, uh, what is quite important to have seen is to uh, have uh, smaller tickets and smaller and uh, on a more human, let's say, uh, size uh, and try to strengthen uh, basically some small companies to prepare them for, for, uh, for bigger transactions. Uh, we've been doing that at Southbridge lately and we've been quite surprised to see that many other initiatives are, are doing that to invest smaller tickets, standardized tickets, but preparing that with uh, for future private equity funds or, or VC funds for, for seed investments. And it's quite, and it's quite uh, let's say, uh, uh, effective. Uh, and all initiatives that uh, will um, basically encourage or strengthen the mobilization of capital for, for small entrepreneurs needs to be uh, encouraged to better, uh, we'll say, um, incentives for management teams, different remuneration models, etc., which should be a, a quite important innovation given the small number of targets. On the, on the debt side here, again, what is quite important is uh, also, and we've seen that in, in our studies, there is a very limited uh, risk assessment uh, teams that actually are able to understand the SME markets in different sectors. And we've seen some initiatives that are probably, um, that are actually uh, supported by, by, uh, um, by the um, LICFE, by uh, IFC, uh, by an, or, or other donors who created some blended uh, financing mechanism to push some sectors or, uh, or, and, and, um, and provide debts uh, for working capital, or small debts. Uh, and the situation there is basically we've seen uh, uh, 97 to 98% reimbursement rates okay. uh, on this SME, at the SME level. However, all the, all the, the gain is offset by the hedging cost because this, this, uh, these uh, uh, funds are, um, are funded in, in foreign currencies. So there are some innovations now where basically we can have some local com- countries, some countries with uh, DFIs, with uh, donors, etc., that are trying to de-risk actually uh, the investments in this, in this uh, debt fund. Okay, great. So you were touching uh, on all these mechanisms. If we were to speak concretely, how can we launch and scale these uh, mechanisms? And I think here what Lionel also mentioned is that we are in a new deal today and uh, to, uh, in, the next, uh, in the next month, uh, African countries will receive at least 1.5% of their GDP literally as a, as a monetary, uh, let's say, uh, creation. And here the main main challenge is actually how to use these funds to leverage other uh, other mechanisms that not have like one for one, but actually uh, investing in in uh, let's say uh, either this debt mechanism or this for the, or encouraging uh, these uh, these private I would say investment companies uh, and trying to uh, actually leverage as much as possible this uh, high this very important amount of. Uh, of funding that is coming to 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 come to the to the continent, um, and so the obsession would be how to obviously leverage this amount, uh, and also how to do risk the different uh, the different uh, you know investors and and also asset managers that are basically uh, are not operating the same environment that in Europe and the US, given the limited number of uh, of uh, the size of the markets and the limited number of transactions that we have. Okay, thank you so much for that insight. Uh, Mr. Dwiri, thanks again for being with us here today. So you have a long-lasting experience um, in Africa. Uh, At Tijari Wafa Bank is now one of the leading Pan-African banking groups with operation in 15 African countries and more than 4,300 branches. Moroccan banks took the lead early on and have acquired in-depth 
knowledge of local markets, let's speak to our audience, shall we? Um, as these, there are different types of potential investors who are watching us today. I would like to address you first as a representative of a listed bank uh, with exposure to many different markets, what's your pitch to a money maker, a money manager sitting in London or New York or Dubai? Thank you very much. So maybe one uh, small uh, element that you missed is that it's over 5,540 physical points of contact with clients. Oh, These right. are not bank branches. This is an addition of all the opportunities that we have on the continent to meet face-to-face -face with clients, either directly or through partnerships. Uh, so agency banking is big on the continent, but it's also distribution through uh, insurance, uh, brokers, etc. Now, just to put uh, the stock in context, we are listed in Casablanca. Uh, we, uh, our market capitalization is $11 billion. Uh, it trades, uh, it's one of the most liquid uh, stocks. Obviously, liquidity is not the strongest point of Casablanca Stock mm -hmm. Exchange, but uh, it's very easy to build uh, a good, sizable position of uh, our stock. Now, why invest in a banking stock, I think should be the first question. Um, it's probably the best proxy to the general economy, at least to the formal, modern, high growth uh, economy of Africa. Uh, second question you should ask yourself is, should you do stock picking in the different banks that are listed either in Morocco, Tunisia, Cairo, uh, um, Lagos um, and, uh, and um, Abidjan? Or should you make things simpler and buy a stock like Etijeri Wafa Bank? And I would argue for the second uh, choice, why? Because you have a very strong domestic base with very clear um, economic strategy, very stable macro, visible uh, evolution of the currency, uh, totally free um, uh, both investment and divestment and dividend repatriation policy. Um, and you have on top of that a combination of controlled banks with the same governance, especially in terms of risk management, but also in terms of compliance, in terms of audits and control, um, in a number of other markets. So in our case, we're present in 14 other African markets, uh, in addition to, to Morocco. And uh, we have 12% of our um, RWA, so uh, risk-weighted assets, on North Africa. This is Tunisia, Egypt, and Mauritania, in our case. 12% again of our RWA in West Africa, and we're present in seven of the eight countries that represent YMU. And we have 5% of our RWA in Central Africa in three, in three countries, soon a fourth country. Uh, so, um, in, um, and then the rest is in Morocco, 71%, 50 of which is on the bank in Morocco, but the rest is on specialized financial uh, services companies uh, that are really present in all the scope that you can uh, imagine in terms of financial services, going from specialized consumer credit, mortgage specialists, um, remittance specialists, uh, um, even long-term car rental. So this is the portfolio that you would be buying but it's not a collection of independent individual companies. It's a fully integrated financial services company. Some of our subsidiaries are listed by themselves, either in Morocco, in Tunisia, or in Abidjan, including the largest insurance company, Wafa Assurance. And all of them work in full synergy in many geographies. Uh, so, for instance, 
in Morocco in order to achieve the kind of efficiency that we are able to, to provide, we clearly separate distribution from production and we use our product specialists as back offices of the bank. So when you go buy your product from the bank in Morocco, you don't know uh, that it's fully manufactured by uh, another subsidiary that you don't see. But it allows us to do maximum mutualization and to reach high levels of efficiency. That's, that's the kind of things that we want to achieve. So in a sense, a very stable domestic base, high growth uh, investment in other markets with a great deal of diversification that takes away the kind of accident that are bound to happen in many uh, countries where the macroeconomic situation is not very stable. Uh, to give you, again, an idea of the diversification, our largest single uh, country presence is 6% of our RWA. And uh, apart from Tunisia, um, Egypt, Senegal and Côte d'Ivoire, all the others are individually below 2% of the RWA. Well, that was clearly a convincing pitch to me. Now, what, what if someone has an investment project on the ground in one of the countries where you are present? Um, what kind of support or financing could you provide this uh, target? Sure. So in each country, we have uh, what the French call universal bank model meaning we serve all the needs of all the different markets. We serve retail, we serve SMEs, and we serve uh, large corporates. And we serve them for all their financing needs, uh, from uh, working capital to investment to trade finance, etc. So I think this is very classical uh, offering. However, on top of that, you have a common CIB, corporate and investment banking team, sitting in Casablanca, in Paris, and in Dubai, that helps structure a number of investments that help also innovate and use uh, the local markets efficiently. So one of the characteristics of talking or of banking with a local uh, or regional African bank is that you make full access or full use of local uh, uh, currency financing. And it depends obviously on your business model and on your needs, but it's a very efficient hedging uh, policy for many uh, uh, international investors. So you have the best of both worlds. You have local banks, but you have international expertise available to you for advice. But then when you also want to invest in Africa, you need more than just the financing. You, you need all the things that are around financing. You need to have access to decision makers. Yeah. You need to understand uh, the information that you get that sometimes is contradictory. Yeah. Uh, you need to have access to information in the first place. You need networks, you need suppliers, you need clients. And th through also another of our initiatives named Club Afrique Développement, we create this network of clients that are permanently uh, discussing through digital ways. Uh, we organize specialized focus on a specific country uh, and sometimes on a specific industry. And the crisis has helped a lot because we do that more often and we do it electronically. And then every other year, everybody is gathered, usually in Casablanca. Uh, it hasn't happened last year yeah. because of what we know, yeah. but it allows also face-to-face -face interaction. And uh, if you look at the six different meetings that we have already organized, uh, it has uh, uh, created more than 22,000 face-to-face, one-on-one uh, meetings between our different clients. And we found that it has been incredibly efficient in increasing uh, trade and investment within Africa. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I have one last question. Um, so in, in 2050, we'll be 2.4 billion of Africans. That's almost 25% of the estimated world population. So financial inclusion is key. We need to cater to all uh, these people. How do you see the future of retail banking? Will it be reinvented in Africa? And if so, is it by you banks or by mobile operators? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very valid question because uh, I forgot to mention that in, in my pitch. Uh, one of the main drivers of uh, faster growth of uh, financial services in the rest of Africa, outside of Morocco, is uh, increasing banking penetration. So in many countries where we entered initially, uh, only 5% of the adult population had access to, the, to a bank account. Ten years later, it's on average 10% in our countries of presence. So on top of the normal growth, macroeconomic growth, you benefit also from more money, more, um, I would say, volumes that are included in the uh, domestic market. And obviously, what we know how to serve are the formal sector. Even for the SMEs, we need uh, a company to be able to articulate a business plan, to be able to justify uh, past performance in order for us to assess the ability to pay us back. Uh, same thing for uh, an individual. We need to see a stable source of revenue. Unfortunately, the vast majority of Africans today are not capable of providing uh, pay, uh, pay, payroll, uh, Uh, from a, a solvent employer. Yeah. Um, and so the big question is how can we serve efficiently uh, retail, low-income uh, uh, retail customers? Um, two uh, problems there. One is cost and efficiency, and it's not through normal branches. It's not even through agency banking because you have high fixed costs in banking, in particular with the IT and now with compliance. So um, cost is an issue. The other uh, issue is how do you assess risk if you don't have data? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so this is where my um, belief, firm belief, is that banks alone will not be able to provide the right answer quickly enough, but that uh, mobile operators are not either. So my um, vision is that uh, together they will come to the conclusion that they need each other. Mobile operators have the low cost uh, solution. They have the access to vast numbers of uh, clients. Uh, they also have the data, the payment data for those who have launched uh, mobile payment. And then banks have all the rest. And I think uh, one of the most important elements with money is trust. And we believe that customers trust us more than mobile operators with their money, that regulators and governments trust us, but also regulate us much more than mobile operators. And so it's a combination of these two players. But let's not forget a third component, which is all those that are around mobile payments. Because you don't necessarily have to be a mobile operator in order to be present in mobile payment, in order to have the data that is necessary to assess the solvency <laughs> of uh, a retail client. So in a sense, it will be a big cooperative uh, effort for the coming 30 years. 
That's great. Well, that has certainly been a recurring theme today, working together, cooperating, and we're all for that. Thank you so much, Mr. Dwiri, for your thoughts and insights. Um, moving on to um, Casablanca Finance City, Lamia Marzouki, you are both Deputy General Manager at Casablanca Finance City. You have actually been part of the journey since the very beginning, and you're also co-chair of the UN Convened Financial Centers for Sustainability Network, which we are very proud of as it is an international network um, and Casablanca is co-chairing for two years with Toronto. So I know for a fact you are passionate about sustainable development and sustainable growth. Um, Africa has the opportunity to leapfrog and build back better after this crisis. How can we catalyze um, more sustainable flows to our continent? Thank you, Manel. I completely agree with you. I mean, there is a strong potential for this pandemic to catalyze a durable shift towards an inclusive, more resilient and low carbon economy. And we need to seize this opportunity to rethink the structure of the economy and to mainstream green finance. And you know, on a global scale, um, actually this pandemic has clearly added further impetus to this ESG agenda. Now, in this context, Africa, um, you know, still is still the weakest link in green finance. Although uh, uh, it represents only 4% of global greenhouse gas emissions, it is particularly affected by climate change. And at the same time, it attracts only less than 5% of international green finance. So how to catalyze more sustainable financing flows to the continent? I believe uh, we must show the world that Africa uh, that there is a will in Africa, you know, to commit to sustainable development and to mainstream and to green the financial systems. And this can be done through multiple ways. One, international cooperation and multilateral action. Two, capacity building. And three, putting in place the right frame conditions and, and enabling uh, a new mechanism, you know, to uh, uh, taking into account these African domestic markets. Um, with regards to the first, the first point, which is international cooperation and multilateral action, we need to be present in the various forums in the world to make Africa voice heard and to boost the uh, you know, interest of international investors. Uh, in, in, in Africa. Africa represents the weakest link in, 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 in green finance, but still, and yet, it has the greatest potential to make massive leapfrogs in sustainable development. And this needs to be heard across the top tier platforms of sustainable networks. I can talk about the FC4S, my ex own experience in, in the FC4S, if you wish to. Yes, sure, please. W what is exactly the FC4S network and what do you do concretely in Africa? So the, the FC4S, the Financial Centers for Sustainability Network, is a collective of 36 green financial centers today, which represents over 80% of global equity markets. So I'm talking about the largest uh, financial centers in the world. It is a partnership between the G7 presidency, the UN environment, and the financial centers. And it was launched in Casablanca on African grounds with the signing of the Casablanca Declaration, thanks to our lobbying, but also to the willingness of the UN environment to include developing countries in, uh, in this process in a co-development approach. The purpose of this network is to accelerate the green finance transition. And within this global network, we were really able to um, create a real space and uh, attentiveness and aura for Africa. So actually, the first regional platform that was created in, 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 within the network was that of Africa. And then we have the European, the Asian platform, but the first one was the African one. Um, and, uh, you know, the process was not that easy because by and large, uh, Africa is at a very early stage of, of sustainable finance transition. But today, the FC4S African chapter is really unique 
not only to attract green investment flows, but also for uh, uh, the emergence of new financial centers bodies. So uh, DFC4S has clearly been a catalyst uh, for this creation, the creation of new financial center bodies, namely Abidjan Finance City, Lagos, the FC4S Lagos, and also Cairo. Uh, so these new financial center bodies were able to uh, adopt sustainability in their strategic priority uh, in their DNA from the start. So this can clearly channel more ingress green investment flows to the continent. However, there are several challenges, uh, you know, which include diverse levels of development in terms of sustainable finance. And even in some countries, sustainable finance is still a niche. This is why my second recommendation is about capacity building. It is about building expert and institutional capacity among stakeholders, be it um, uh, policymakers, regulators, industry players, and so on. Uh, and you know, this step should be the first step actually to take uh, through training programs, but also through raising the awareness and rallying uh, the stakeholders, the stakeholders around. Uh, green finance in, in Africa. Last but not least, to be able to channel uh, those investment flows to the continent, we need to put in place the right framework uh, uh, to attract these investment flows. This is actually what we have done in Casa Finance City uh, because we have put in place a broad value proposition that enabled us to attract international investment flows as Africa 50, for instance, and channel them to the region. Uh, I'm talking about doing business fast tracks, uh, community intelligence, expertise on how to do business in Africa, and obviously also putting in place all the legal and regulatory framework for that. Now, the challenge is really uh, to upscale this value proposition and to have something more specific for green finance. Um, and this is something that we are tackling today within our international partnerships. Now, to echo what Lionel and what Hassan just mentioned, uh, and that brings me to my last point, we should encourage new uh, mechanisms and, and integrate you know, the domestic African flows and the specificity of, of, of different countries within this framework. And uh, for me, in this United Africa Day, the future of finance can only be sustainable. Awesome. Thank you so, so much for those insights. Well, it has definitely been a lively discussion with great insights. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I certainly did. On behalf of Casablanca Finance City, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for spending your most precious asset with us, which is your time. We appreciate you. We look forward to hearing from you. I'll just wrap up today with one final question for you who's watching us today. What is your narrative on Africa? Share your success story. Let us know in the comments below. We'll be reading those one by one. So thanks again, everyone. Please be safe out there and we'll see you very soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>